Hello, everyone. Good evening to our Portland Art Museum and Northwest Film Center members. Welcome to our annual Members Update, Keeping Connected. My name is John Goodwin, Director of Community Philanthropy for the Museum and the Film Center. This theme of keeping connected is more important than ever as this pandemic keeps sticking around. Our galleries are open and we have just began two fabulous new exhibitions. One is a monumental display about the life of an Egyptian queen, Nefertari. And the other is a brilliant survey of mostly interior scenes similar to the ones we've experienced of the last 18 months. There are French paintings from the late 1800s and the early 1900s. With that said, we are still being cautious with large gatherings like an in-person annual meeting. On the bright side, last year's members update had great attendance and many more who watched the video afterwards. So this change just might stick around. So we're glad to be here sharing the updates, electing new trustees and highlighting the power of community tonight. Thank you so much for your membership and your continued support. First things first, we have the pleasure of electing new trustees and welcoming our new board chair. I'll turn it over to our outgoing board chair and my good friend, Fred Jubitz, to say a few words. Thanks, John, and hello to all of our members. We appreciate you so much. Here we are in another pandemic November. No one knew what to expect those many months ago when we closed the gallery doors. Since that time, there have been many ups and downs, and through it all, the museum and film center have shown incredible resilience. It has been a wonderful experience for me to work with Brian and the entire professional staff at the museum. I have a much stronger appreciation for their level of expertise and thank them for the magnificent job they did guiding us through this challenging time. To my fellow board members, thank you for your ongoing commitment to the museum. It has been a pleasure working with all of you. Tonight, I pass the chairmanship on and I have every confidence that our board leadership is committed to the museum and goals of this organization to serve, support, and be part of our community. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our incoming officers. They are Chair Alex Goodman, Vice Chair Angela Snow, Treasurer Jen Park, Secretary Mary Lee Boakland. Let me say a few words about Alex Meyer Goodman. Alex follows in the footsteps of her parents, Roger and Laura Meyer, whose legacy is nearly unmatched. And Laura continues to serve as a life trustee. Alex has been deeply involved as a trustee for many years and her leadership skills, particularly as the co-chair of the museum's connection campaign, gives me great confidence that she is more than up to the task. So Alex, the gavel is now yours. Hello, I'm excited to be the museum's incoming board chair. For those that don't know me, I'm a fifth generation Oregonian who started visiting the museum as a child and never stopped. I've served on this board for seven years and previously chaired several school and hospital endeavors. My father, Roger Meyer, was also a museum chair. This annual meeting is an important forum through which we members, distinguished stakeholders all, catch up about this unprecedented year and the work ahead. There are multiple opportunities for everyone to participate, online and in person, attesting to the museum's comprehensive, inclusive, and diversified approach to activities. Your investment in this organization is having a genuine impact on enhancing our region. At a time of continued global challenges, PAM has proven its leadership and commitment to the stability and progress of its operations. The importance of institutional improvement and learning is part and parcel of this process. We look to build many connections in the coming months for the benefit of our historic institution and community. Thank you to all who serve on the board and to the thousands of members who embrace the museum's mission. Tonight, we'll be voting to approve an incoming slate of trustees, two who are new to the board 
Mary Boyle and Kaberi Banerjee Murthy, and four returning trustees, Selby Key, Stephen McGeady, April Sanderson, and Bob Warren. All of them are unanimously recommended by the Board of Trustees. And now I'll turn the meeting back over to John for voting. Thank you, Alex. We are so thrilled to have you as our new board chair, and I know we'll do great things together. Now, everyone should see a poll pop up on their screens. Take a moment to vote for the slate of trustees. This is what will happen. You'll have about 20 seconds. You can X out of the poll when you're finished, and it'll disappear from your screen. That's it. Thank you. Now that that business is taken care of, we can get to the fun stuff, looking back at the year, expressing gratitude, and taking a peek at what's ahead. We'll begin by hearing from museum director and chief curator, Brian Fariso. Thank you, John, and welcome. And a big thanks to you, our members, for being here and for your unwavering support. Welcome also to our new trustees and new board chair, Alex Goodman. Before I say a few words about Alex, I would like to express my gratitude to outgoing chair Fred Jubitz. Fred has served with distinction, helping guide this museum through one of our most tumultuous times in history. Fred's steady hand and he and his wife Gail's generosity allowed us to be well positioned to reemerge in a new and exciting way. Thank you, Fred, for all that you've done. Our entire community is grateful. Incoming chair Alex Goodman and her family have been integral to the museum's success and growth for more than 50 years. I'm honored that she accepted the invitation to lead at this pivotal time. Her love of art and community, experiences in education and public service, and deep commitment to Oregon make her the ideal leader. The pandemic continues to impact our lives and the museum and Northwest Film Center have not been spared. Multiple closures and the uncertainty over the past 19 months have changed us clarified our vision, and brought us closer together. As we look ahead to a time when the pandemic recedes, we are focused on rebuilding our staff, continuing to advance our equity and inclusion goals, and realizing our vision articulated in our connection campaign, which includes strengthening our finances and improving our campus to ensure the museum is an accessible and inclusive resource and a cornerstone of Portland's rebirth. Throughout the past year, we have been committed to staying connected to members, visitors, and supporters bringing to life the exhibitions and programs we have all been anticipating and creating new opportunities. In the summer, we were thrilled to finally open Ansel Adams in our time. It was heartening to see visitors return to the galleries. Thanks to many, the museum and film center continued to create safe experiences in outdoor spaces, like the Cinema Unbound Awards, projections on our buildings, open air cinema, and community events with the Numbers FM. The community partnerships continue to bring vibrant new perspectives to our work, and one in particular stands out for its uniqueness and impact, the Numbers FM. It is a pleasure to welcome DJ Ambush to speak about the residency here at the museum. Thanks, Brian. If I had to choose a word to describe the partnership between the Numbers 96.7 and the Portland Art Museum, I would say organic. One of the things that I try to let people know every time we discuss the great work that we've been doing here is the time in which it happened and how we came together and really made the right decisions around what it, what it felt like to invite an organization like ours into the museum. Being able to share space and just have full run of the facilities to create interviews and content within such a creative venue is just absolutely amazing. For us, it's felt like a true example of allyship and the things that can come as a result of that, um, not being done in a performative manner, not being done in some way that feels forced or, or mechanical. Um, one of the things that did happen, one of the many things that did happen was our ability to program for the Madison Park Let, uh, the Madison Street Park. It was a collaboration with the museum, ourselves, and Peabot. We were able to provide entertainment for uh, the local community down here. Uh, we created opportunities for artists of color to come down and 
entertain people and be paid, be compensated for that during the time of the pandemic when they didn't have anywhere else to perform. That was an amazing, amazing situation for us. And then our ability to run the Sights and Sounds Youth Content Creation Camp. It was a four week camp where the kids came in, they learned everything from video production, audio recording and engineering and how to just put a little twist on what they've already been doing with their phones. And then we sent everyone home with little packets that had little cameras, little recorders and, and, and cameras. Unfortunately, we had to cut that short by two weeks because of the COVID numbers. But through another partnership with OHA and REACH, we were able to conduct some COVID clinics, vaccination clinics, right out front in the parklet and ran that for a couple of weeks too. And without this partnership, none of those things would have been possible. Back to you, Brian. Thank you, Ambush. I've also been so grateful to our staff for their hard work and their commitment to the city. Staff have participated in downtown cleanup days, hosted blood drives, and supported our partners on pop-up vaccine clinics. I know many of you have come to know our visitor services associates when you visit, and there are many other staff members who help fulfill our mission. Let us hear from some of them now as they reflect on the past year. The museum has endured an incredible year, um, challenges and victories and uh, joyous moments and sad moments. And I think for me, the best part has been working with my colleagues. I started working in 2009 and, um, you know, we were sort of in a, somewhat of a routine, um, but there was also a sense of urgency to change the museum because we still were trying to really reach more out into the community. And I think that in this last year, this last year and a half, that community outreach has, has upped in tempo, knowing that so many people needed art to sustain them during what was such a dark and lonely time. So the way that our, um, our learning community partnerships and our curators working with our marketing and communications whizzes were able to um, create great online programming. And then we, we just got a lot more partnerships. You know, our art kits out to the schools, our, our work with the Numbers FM radio station, um, pop-up exhibitions, and just bringing in a whole new community into the museum. I think this has actually offered an opportunity and, and it's opened our eyes to even more potential for the museum and how we can interact with our visitors and our community. This past year has been interesting, to say the least with the museum opening and closing and opening and closing, it's definitely hard. So I feel with everybody and everything going on, the Ansel Adams opening, we were super excited and then it closed and then we could only let six people in and people were frustrated, of course. And I felt with them because I was like, I know how things are going in my life. And if there's one thing I'd wanna see is the Ansel Adams and I can't even come in because we can only let six people in. Of course, that's going to be frustrating. But luckily, as time went on, we were able to have things open. And I think people come to appreciate the little things when the whole world is changing. I think that's what I really enjoy about our members and our visitors is that they can sympathize with us. They understand that things are going to be different. Things are changing. A highlight for me, honestly, has been being able to do the Instagram stories because I feel like I can express myself in those Instagram stories. I can do silly stuff, I can do funny stuff, I can highlight stuff that people probably don't see. And I think that's one of my main reasons is that I can highlight stuff that is in like the Native American galleries. I think that needs to be highlighted more. And if I could use my voice to highlight black artists, Mexican artists, Latino artists, basically artists that I feel are underrepresented, I wanna do that. So I thank you for letting me do that for the Instagram. This past year has been really an incredible experience for me. Um, having had this opportunity to continue to build relationships with artists, many of whom are not only individuals who I am proud to work with and represent, but also now count as, as great friends as well. Earlier this year, tragically, we lost Jennifer Zika, the manager of the Rental Sales Gallery for more than 20 years. Uh, and I came in as the new uh, gallery manager. Uh, I had previously served as the gallery supervisor, working with Jennifer for more than two years, so I was in the fortunate place to be able to come in knowing how the gallery operates and already having strong existing relationships with the artists and our client base as well. A particular standout moment for me this year has been overseeing the completion of the Metal Sales Gallery's full show. Uh, it's the first time I've had this opportunity to fully 
manage the process from calling out to artists to uh, submit new artworks, managing the jurying process and then making the selections and ultimately ending up displaying the pieces in the gallery. To be in this position to fully see a process through from start to finish was a really special moment and that was a, a real point of personal pride for me. This past year hasn't been easy for anyone. In fact, the last year and a half hasn't been easy for anyone. And uh, one thing that helps me right now is going to work because work is my escape. I can come here and uh, I'm actually learning things about art through by osmosis, listening to uh, the preps, the VSAs, the curators, and uh, people coming back to the offices. Uh, that's great. I finally can see some of the names of people that I've been emailing. I worked graveyard shift for so long that uh, I never knew anybody that worked in the day. I'm actually getting to see families come out. I can see groups of kids. I can see couples going through the museum. It's, it's my way of actually connecting back to people. The most exciting thing I had this last year was absolutely the Venice VR exhibition. We were able to work with so many great people, working with staff from both sides of the museum as well as the film center. We had so much fun to show our community what is possible using VR technology and combining that with different ways of storytelling, including working with uh, the mobile projection unit, having beautiful art up on the walls, all through projection mapping. Over the last year, we held a few events out in our courtyard. It was so much fun to see visual projections up on the outside walls of the museum, as well as working with musicians and pulling out sound. We even had one event where we worked with a fantastic musician down in California, projecting her live onto one of the walls here at the museum out in our courtyard. So we're excited to be able to come back strong and looking forward to hosting live events again as our community is able to come back into our spaces and looking forward to lectures, auctions, galas, Slowly but surely, we're coming back. Even though this year has been filled with challenges and we've had to pause some of our access programs, it has created more opportunities to focus on other important accessibility projects. A couple of us have received training on image and audio description and are working to train staff in these skills. We are aiming to have all of our social media posts include image descriptions and captions. For the first time, we are offering written image descriptions for all of the objects in Queen Nefertari's Egypt and in the private lives of the Nabi. If you came to see Ansel Adams in our time, you may have noticed the QR codes at the beginning of each section. These codes link to digital accessible labels. All of the object labels and wall text in the exhibition are in this accessible format. We are excited to take it one step further and combine these accessible labels with image descriptions in Queen Nefertari's Egypt and the private lives of the Nabi. We have also worked to make our online programming more accessible. We have started the practice of including verbal descriptions of the speakers and their environment. We offer audio description upon request and are working to incorporate verbal descriptions of slides shown. We have also been providing ASL English interpreting and automated real-time captions for each online program. We have also partnered more closely with disabled artists. Multiple disabled artists have been part of our artist fund in this last year. We have also had the privilege of hosting a panel by disabled artists during the Ansel Adams in Our Time exhibition. Claiming connection, cultivating a relationship with place as disabled artists was wonderful. If you missed it, I encourage you to check it out on our YouTube channel. I hope you all enjoy the great exhibitions we have right now and those to come. The best part of my job is that I get to work with just about every department and no two projects are the same. That's been especially true for this past year. Not only do I get to work with the Department of Learning and Community Partnerships on some of our programs and accessibility efforts, but I've had more chances than ever to work with the Northwest Film Center. I had the joy of creating pre-show trivia and word scramble videos to precede this past summer's open air cinema series at the Lloyd Center in OMSI. I also had the honor of filming, editing, and assembling the entire Cinema Unbound Awards presentation that went out to a drive-in audience at Zydell Yards as well as virtually in a live stream. But one of my favorite things to do is see the art and connect with our visitors when I'm filming or taking photos in the galleries. 
In fact, my biggest highlight of the past year might have been when my parents were in town and I took them through the Ansel Adams exhibition. Watching my father lose his mind over Moonrise Hernandez is an experience I'll never forget. Thank you, Brian, for your informative and exciting report of our thrilling past year and to Ambush for sharing great information about our community partnership. And wow, after hearing from my amazing colleagues, it comes as no surprise to me that we've accomplished so much this past year despite the challenges. We are so proud to have been able to continue our work with youth and educators. And here to share that with you is Hannah Lason. Thanks, John. And thank you members so much. We are grateful to you for how you've continued to support the museum and have allowed us to continue connecting with students and educators, even during this long shutdown and these uncertain times. This year, we've been really busy creating virtual programs for educators, online resources, so they can share exhibitions like Ansel Adams in our time with their students, even when they couldn't bring their students to the museum. Uh, we've continued the Poster Project, a really popular resource that features works from the permanent collection. We mail these posters out to schools so they can have some artwork in their classrooms. Um, it's also a great online resource that everyone can use that you can find on our website. We kept up uh, a collaboration with a lot of other museums in the region and presented an educator unconference this summer that explored topics of memory and public space. We wanted to give students and teachers tools for engaging with these big questions, taking up the, the monuments that have come down all around Portland, exploring what people want from monuments, what we want from public space, how we remember things collectively. And we also uh, have managed to have some really meaningful in-person programs um, this past summer. On July 31st, we collaborated with a lot of different partners um, in order to host uh, the See Me, I Am Here, a creative activation of youth voices of color program. This was a partnership with the city of Portland and the community healing through art initiative. And it also included lots of other organizations, the numbers radio station, a beat happening, which uh, helped connect us with some youth DJs, Renee Mitchell's I am more organization, a wonderful youth led uh, creative um, organization, NEA Many Nations Academy. Uh, so just so many organizations and had families drop in and create art and make prints and get to be together during that period when we could feel comfortable being together outdoors um, before the Delta variant came up. Last spring, we kept up our annual partnership with Portland Public Schools and the Student Art Showcase, the Heart of Portland. Normally, in a, in a typical year, this would be a, a student art exhibition in the Miller Gallery. It would be a big in-person event where student dancers and uh, actors and poets are performing their work and a thousand people show up. We couldn't do it that way this spring. But what we did do was connect the teachers and students with the exhibition Ansel Adams in our time. The teachers introduced some of the artwork through slideshows to their students. They explored some of the themes. How do we connect with the land? Uh, how do we explore internal landscapes as well as external landscapes? And the teachers came up with this wonderful Postcards to the Earth project where students created artwork on one side of a postcard, and on the other side, they wrote a message of gratitude. Uh, and we presented these works in the gift shop 
Uh, they hung from the window and turned into a really beautiful student art exhibition that was up all summer um, until, until the Ansel Adams exhibition came down. We've also continued our weekly partnership with Right Around Portland, and a nonprofit organization that encourages community through writing. Um, and with Write Around Portland staff, we develop weekly prompts in our Write Around Pam series. These get posted on social media and, uh, and also go up on our blog. And these are open for everyone. So if you tune in Sundays um, or any time really during the week, you can check the blog. You'll see some beautiful or provocative or inspiring artwork and you'll learn a little bit about the artwork and also get a couple writing prompts um, to encourage everyone to just sit down for five minutes on a Sunday and, you know, free write your, your thoughts as you look at and think, at, think about that artwork. And we couldn't be doing that without the wonderful, generous, and continuous support of members. So thank you all so much. And back to you, John. Seeing everything we've done over the past year in one place is impressive. It's been a team effort for sure. It's the same team that drives our finance and fundraising here at the museum. Donations, grants, relief funds, budget balancing, projections, and investment portfolios have kept our literal and figurative doors open. Let's hear from our Chief Financial Officer and Director of Development. Thank you, John. During the year ended June 30th, 2021, our finances were again dominated by the global pandemic for the second year in a row. After reopening in July 2020 with a state-imposed capacity restriction of just 250 people, we were forced to close again in November for another five months before reopening for a second time in April of this year. During this period, we were successful in securing a second round of Paycheck Protection Program funding that again allowed us to continue to pay staff who were not working for a further two months. I'm happy to report that once we reopened and the capacity restrictions were relaxed, attendance numbers climbed steadily, reaching near normal levels by the time the Ansel Adams exhibition closed in July. And this in turn allowed us to start adding back staff. What is particularly heartening is the high percentage of non-member visitors indicating perhaps the museum's role as a place of refuge and solace for people in these difficult times. When we look at all three of what I call the COVID years, that is 2020, 21, and 22, we will have been closed for nine of those 36 months and operating with significant capacity restrictions for another 12. That leaves just 15 months or only 42% of the time when we will have been operating normally. We calculate the financial impact of this to be a loss of earned income of around $9 million over the three years. Government relief programs such as the PPP program I mentioned will make up some $7.7 .7 million of this, leaving a shortfall of $1.3 million to be covered by our reserves. Because of this support, and our diligent focus on managing expenses over the last 19 months, we ended the year with a positive cash position. And there's further good news when we look at our investment portfolio. The balance at June 30th was $69.2 million, split across the various asset classes, as you can see here. Thanks to a very positive year in the stock market, our return for the year was 25.8%, which was within 0.3% of our benchmark and puts us in the 58th percentile when compared with similar sized funds. Because we're invested for the long term, we focus on long term returns, and so we're also happy that our 10 year return was 8.6%, which is in the 28th percentile. These funds get put to good use each year, and were even more important in a year when our earned income suffered. Our endowment income supports our general operating needs, like keeping the lights on as well as our access programs, and so much more. Thank you all for your support. And now over to our Director of Development, Kerry Birch. Thank you, Gareth. You're right. 
Our endowment supports so many important access programs. It's hard to believe it's been 13 years since we launched free school tours and free admission for youth 17 and under. Supporters made that possible, and it's a great segue to my report on the power of giving. I want to begin by thanking our supporters for stepping up in big ways, especially over the last 20 months. In reflecting on the impact that your support had on our mission and financial stability, a few highlights come to mind. 66% of all gifts were given without restrictions. The trust you exemplified with this support gave us the flexibility we needed to adapt and provide programs and exhibitions in new ways, while also supporting the arts ecosystem with initiatives like the Artist Fund. Also, donors and members gave at all levels. And in fact, we were supported by more donors from more parts of the community than ever. Through gifts of all sizes, this collective show of support for the museum had a significant impact on our mission. This season, we will carry forward the power of gratitude and coming together by asking our members and wider community to join in Giving Tuesday. Mark your calendars for November 30th for this year's Global Day of Giving Back. And in the spirit of gratitude, I would like to thank you, our members, for your loyalty despite closures and limits on attendance. We appreciate all of you who renewed or rejoined, and a warm welcome to our newest members. As Gareth mentioned, we also received significant relief funding this year from the state and federal government. This funding not only helped prevent drastic cuts to our staff and programs during our closure, but helped make it possible for visitors to safely relax, enjoy art, and recover from the health impacts of the pandemic when we reopened. And with that, I would be remiss if I didn't give a special thanks to our partners in that. The Regional Arts and Culture Council, the Oregon Cultural Trust, the Oregon Arts Commission, and the Cultural Advocacy Coalition of Oregon, and all the other institutions and representatives that continue to support us and the arts. Here's a special message from our local elected officials. This is State Representative Janelle Bynum. And when I think about all of the things that we're trying to do in this world, I think that we need to have places where we can experience joy and peace. And for me, that's the Portland Art Museum. Thank you for all that you do and all that you give. Thank you for being a wonderful part of Oregon. Greetings, friends. As you meet to chart the path forward during these extraordinary times, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to you, your staff, and the members for all the critical work you do to bring arts to our community. For 129 years, the Portland Art Museum has been a beacon in Portland's vibrant art scene. To say the least, the last 18 months have been difficult. Even jarring would be a severe understatement. Yet in the wake of the deadliest pandemic since the Spanish flu 100 years ago, which the museum had the weather. I'm in awe of the number of initiatives you've led to lift artists from marginalized and underserved populations. You offer them a platform they otherwise would not have, an opportunity to share their lived experience and explore identity through the power of art, the art of expression. This is vitally important in strengthening the social bonds of our community. It must be a key part of the path forward. We should be providing young artists with the resources they need and encouraging them to look within in their community for inspiration. This is how we heal. This is how we build back better. Thank you for your tireless service. I'm humbled to be your representative. Hi, I'm Portland City Commissioner Mangus Maps, and I just wanted to take a moment to recognize the Portland Art Museum for the amazing work they do in our community. Um, and I want to thank each and every one of you for your support of the museum, too. Now, I'm especially grateful for all that the museum does for our local artists. For example, last year, the museum provided more than $200,000 in support to local artists, especially artists of color. One of my favorite projects the museum has sponsored recently is the fact that they've hosted The Numbers, which is a locally owned black radio station. Uh, the Portland Art Museum also does great work with kids of color through Self-Enhancement Incorporated and the Native American Youth and Family Center. 
And recently, I had the privilege of touring the art museum where I saw amazing work by internationally renowned Black artists. I can't wait to go back, and I look forward to seeing you there soon. Greetings to all the board members, staff, and guests attending this year's annual meeting of the Portland Art Museum. Senator Jeff Merkley here. And a big thanks to all of you, as well as to the members and staff of the Northwest Film Center for all that you do to help us expand our minds and our culture. Whether it's supporting local artists or lifting up BIPOC and native led community organizations, educating our younger generations through lesson plans and online tools, or exposing all of us to the works of artists like Sharita Town and Frida Kahlo. The work that you do is vital to our community. And I know that the last year and a half have been difficult for the museum as it's been for everyone. But that's why you and art in general are so important right now. It enriches our lives, inspires our imaginations, gives us the, the freedom to dream. And it's particularly important as we emerge from the fear and the isolation of the pandemic. That's why earlier this summer, I was thrilled to help secure funding from the National Endowment of the Arts for the museum and for other art programs and organizations. Pablo Picasso once said, art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. And there's no question that each and every one of our souls could use a good washing once in a while. That's why I look forward to continuing to partner with all of you in the days, months, and years ahead. Let's support our community artists so they in turn can feed our souls and uplift our spirits. Hi there, I'm State Representative Rob Nose. My district includes most of Southeast Portland and a little sliver of Northeast Portland. This past legislative session, I was proud to fight for legislation to help our cultural institutions like yours, the Portland Art Museum. The work the museum was able to do this past year from my estimation was frankly remarkable. You all provided more than 200,000 in direct relief grants to local artists prioritizing BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, and neurodiverse artists, as well as artists with disabilities. You also distributed more than 1,400 art kits to underserved middle school students last summer. It's great to see the Portland Art Museum is focused on making sure its programs, resource artists, and organizations that have historically been underrepresented by art museums in the United States. I'm proud that we have such strong cultural institutions like yours in this city, and I'm not just saying that. Thank you for all that you do. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to share a few words with you during your meeting. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Commissioner Carmen Drupio, and I'm the city's arts and culture commissioner. When I assumed this role in January, it quickly became apparent how COVID was changing how Portlanders experience arts and culture. Encountering art remotely from our homes and often digitally underscored how much art helps us. It helps us to recognize our humanity and our collective experience around the globe during this time. Also, it helps us in reinforcing our communities and also creating new ones. And it's also help, helpful to us in celebrating in grieving and in healing. In my 10 months of this role, it's been really inspiring to see our arts institutions ensuring that art can continue to function in these critical ways, because the truth is it makes a difference in our lives. And so I'm here to share my gratitude and appreciation. Thank you for all that Portland Art Museum did to support local artists through direct relief grants, especially black indigenous people of color, and LGBTQIA plus and neurodiverse artists and artists with disabilities. Thank you for supporting Portland area students so that even during our most challenging months, art was not another educational gap they experienced while learning remotely. And thank you for partnering with our city's community-based organizations to ensure that our diverse and growing communities understand the gem of an institution that Portland Art Museum is and that these vibrant spaces include them too. And finally, thank you for your love for the city, for your service, and for celebrating all our forms of cultural and artistic expression. It's because of these visionaries and advocates like yourselves that we are sustaining the heart and soul of Portland during these challenging times. And as I continue to learn and grow in my role, I look forward to continuing our partnership and getting to know each one of you, and hopefully one day in person. 
Again, on behalf of the city of Portland and from the bottom of my heart, mil gracias for your invaluable contributions to Portland's art and culture community and best wishes for your board meeting. In closing, we're so excited about the year ahead. Your philanthropic investments in arts organizations like ours directly impact the health and vitality of our region. While it was a difficult year, in many ways, we remain optimistic and grounded in our mission with our donors and members in our corner. We really can't thank you enough. Thank you, Garrett, for stewarding our finances and to Carrie for your tireless efforts leading us towards our fundraising goals. And now to the looking ahead part, my favorite. Next up, you'll hear all about exhibitions that are currently on view and coming in the months and years ahead. Private Lives, Home and Family in the Art of the Nabis is an international loan exhibition that brings together some of the finest paintings, drawings, and prints of the 1890s. The story revolves around four friends, all young artists in Paris, Pierre Bonnard, Edouard Vuillard, Maurice Denis, and Félix Vallotton. Together they created an artistic brotherhood, the Nabi, a Hebrew word that means prophets. They turned their backs on the noise and spectacle of Parisian nightlife and instead found inspiration in intimate interiors populated by family and their closest friends. Although their styles varied, each returned repeatedly to the motifs of home life, romantic love, and family. Yet the domestic world was not always what it seemed. Suppressed secrets, hidden affairs, and familial tension bubble beneath the surface, challenging the viewer to construct the unspoken narrative of these small but powerful images of interiors, gardens, and the city of Paris. Since the Nabi sought to suggest rather than to describe, there is a great deal of room for interpretation in each image. What you see might depend on how you feel that day. Do these cozy interiors relax you, or do they suggest claustrophobia? Are the lovers whispering their secret promises or crafting lies? Come see Private Lives and decide for yourself. After nearly two years of quarantining in our homes, these questions about home and family have never been more relevant. I look forward to welcoming you to this exhibition. Queen Nefertari's Egypt is a beautiful exploration of a culture and time over 3,000 years ago. It is an immersive experience of nearly 230 objects from the world-renowned Egizio Museum of Turin, Italy. The exhibition not only sheds light on the favored wife of Ramses II, who called her the one whom the sun shines, but also explores the Valley of the Queens, a site in Egypt where the wives of pharaohs were buried, and the many aspects of daily life of this time and place that continues to intrigue. The exhibition is on view through January 16th, and we cannot wait for you to see it. This past July, we welcomed Portland artist Sherita Town as our latest Apex artist. This gallery, which is on the fourth floor of the main building, adjacent to the Oxmute Gallery, showcases a collection of videos, ephemera, and installations that reflect her own public art throughout the city. This exhibition, titled Sherita Town and a Black Art Ecology of Portland, encourages our visitors to acknowledge the active, creative vitality of Black communities from the past, present, and into the future of Portland, including collaborations with Nat Turner Project, Imagine Black, and the Northwest Black Comedy Festival, to name a few. With this exhibition, Sherita Town includes the many names of her artistic collaborators and community partners. I encourage you to spend some time with this important work, which is on view through July of 2022. MESH is an exhibition of four Native artists who are still early in their careers, but busting out with bold and exciting work. When I was organizing this exhibition, I wasn't really looking for art that fit a particular theme. But as I began to make my selections, I realized that all four artists were addressing current events and urgent social issues in different ways. 
Kaela Farrell Smith is a Klamath Modoc painter and conceptual artist who has been active in the arts community in Portland since she was a local art student over a decade ago. She is deeply committed to addressing land and water rights issues in her tribal community, as well as wider societal issues which come across so vividly in her Land Back series. Lehua Uakea is a native Hawaiian artist who also has a strong connection to Portland. They use labor-intensive techniques passed down through generations to create delicate yet powerful works from handmade kapa paper patterned with hand-carved tools and natural pigments. These are both acts of resistance and protest as well as celebratory expressions of cultural resilience. Leah Rose Kolakowski is an Ojibwa artist now living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, who uses her luminous photography as a form of storytelling. Her images celebrate the beauty of indigenous culture, but also draw our attention to under-recognized and often unseen problems, such as the preponderance of murdered and missing indigenous women. I'm standing in front of a mural in the exhibition gallery created by Dene Taus and Chiricahua Apache artist, Lynette Houses. As a muralist creating large scale, but often ephemeral paintings in public or semi-public locations, Lynette sees her work as a form of activism. This mural is an act of rematriating the Portland Art Museum, reaffirming the presence of Native people and the power of Native women. This exhibition is a Center for Contemporary Native American Art program, featured in the museum's Jubit Center for Modern and Contemporary Art on the fourth floor. You can see all of this exciting work in person when MESH opens this week. The Oxmute Gallery is something that came about as part of our partnership with the Portland Art Museum as a way to elevate BIPOC artists here based in Portland, Oregon. And the selection process here for our collection is based on the expertise of local BIPOC artists. Uh, we are presently featuring Sarah Sabino. She's the first artist um, from our exhibition. And then next month we'll have Jason Hill, a local photographer. So I encourage you, please check out the website Check out all the artists we have coming up next, and I look forward to seeing you. I am so excited to be bringing you a new collaborative installation called Opacity Performance with a group of fantastic performers. Visitors will encounter three performance areas in the main European gallery, where I'm standing right now. The dividing curtains of each section will obscure and reveal the dancers, creating a new viewing experience depending on your vantage point. Opacity Performance explores how visibility and invisibility impact both the performer's and the audience's experience, and how the state of being opaque that is resisting the power of dynamics of seeing and objectification can empower those who are usually seen as the other. Or perhaps you come out of it with your own interpretation. We'll be right here at the museum the weekends of January 28th, February 4th, and February 11th. All of the performers and collaborators look forward to sharing this space with you early next year. After a year that certainly brought out our creativity to serve our ever-expanding audiences in new ways, with over 200 screenings, 25 classes, and awarding with the Portland Art Museum over $100,000 in grants to media arts creatives, we are looking forward to continuing the Film Center's 50th year with even more opportunities for our members to experience cinematic storytelling in all new ways. And now, drumroll please, your PAM membership now makes you a member of the Northwest Film Center. That's right, you'll have access to exclusive programming, enjoy discounts to our classes, workshops and screenings, as well as help us with our mission to change for whom, by whom, and how cinematic stories are told. What are some of the new benefits? Well, since last October, our collaboratory classes brought you virtual opportunities where art and cinema collide. You don't have to love film to be a part of the collab and to learn. We are open to all. And so far, we've had classes on everything from inclusive writing techniques, the art of poster design, score composition, stop motion and puppetry classes for kids and teens, and my personal favorite, our Bollywood series, where folks learned not only about the history of Bollywood cinema, but they learned the dance moves too. As we venture into another year, we will continue to experiment with the collaboratory, bringing you brand new experiences each month. And yes, we've heard you loud and clear, more Bollywood is back again to dance the gloomy weather away starting next month. 
Another program that we rolled out last year and are excited to continue is the Sustainability Labs, a new way of envisioning mentorship by prioritizing holistic career advancement and sustainability over singular project completion. It's a lab that helps people change, grow, and sustain, acting as a catalyst for selected artists, but also for change and growth in our community and the ecosystem at large. With funding assistance from the National Endowment for the Arts and generous contributions from Joan Cirillo, Roger Cook, and the Real Foundation for Art and Creativity, this program selects five applicants from Oregon and beyond to receive bespoke support on creative, business, and personal sustainability. Mentors from Nike, Wyden and Kennedy, the Venice Biennale, as well as known directors and producers are all participating because nurturing artists is a major factor in the Film Center's mission, and we can't wait to grow this program in the coming years. And we are so excited to present our third annual Cinema Unbound Awards this spring, celebrating folks that explore where cinema and art collide and are not content to be contained. Our first Cinema Unbound Awards ceremony took place in the museum's Crydell Grand Ballroom just days before the COVID-19 lockdown with a surprise appearance from 2020 Academy Award winner for Best Picture, Bong Joon-ho. The second was experienced both online and in person at the drive-in experience at Zydell Yards, featuring Gus Van Sant, 2021 Academy Award winner for Best Picture, Chloe Zhao, and even the creative director of Gucci. And as we speak, we are currently exploring new ways for you, our members, to experience this year's show, and we'll be revealing this year's honorees very soon. We have so many more Unbound experiences on the horizon, including some new surprises that will take cinematic and experiential storytelling to a whole new level. So stay tuned, and I can't wait to hear what you think and see you in person in brighter days ahead. Constructing Revolution explores the remarkable and wide-ranging body of propaganda posters as an artistic consequence of the 1917 Russian Revolution. This vibrant show delves into a relatively short-lived era of unprecedented experimentation and utopian idealism, which produced some of the most striking images of 20th century graphic design. This exhibition surveys genres and methods of early Soviet poster design and introduces the most prominent artists of the movement. Reflecting the turbulent and ultimately tragic history of Russia in the 1920s and 30s, it charts the formative decades of the USSR and demonstrates the tight bond between Soviet art and ideology. The galleries will be arranged thematically to explore topics such as the role of Soviet women, avant-garde film, and the ideal Soviet citizen. I look forward to welcoming you to our galleries to discover the power of the poster. Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera are two of Mexico's most celebrated artists and one of the most well-known artistic couples of the 20th century. This exhibition features several of Kahlo's iconic self-portraits, as well as rarely seen oil paintings by Rivera. Their work is contextualized by photographs and paintings by other significant Mexican modernists. The exhibition reflects the development of Mexico as a hub for avant-garde art and ideas in the first half of the 20th century. This exhibition will offer our audiences a rare opportunity to see firsthand important work by two of the most prominent and recognizable artists of the 20th century. The exhibition also celebrates the artists and their sense of community, it tells a story of innovation across artistic media and offers a look into the artists' lives, lifestyles, and relationships. This slate of exhibitions is dynamic and I can't wait for you all to experience them. I'm especially proud to see the diverse range of artists and cultures being represented. As a visitor and as a staff member, it's important to be able to see yourself and your heritage reflected at the museum and the film center. Exhibitions and acquisitions tell just one side of the equity and inclusion work that we are doing. Our equity team and many other staff members have been working tirelessly to keep racial equity and justice work moving forward. I know because I'm on the equity team. Alongside all of our day jobs, we meet regularly and move initiatives forward that we hope will lead to a more inclusive and welcoming museum. My colleague and fellow equity team member, Tiana, shares an update. 
Half a day. My name is Tiana and I work in our membership department. I am also a member of our equity team. I serve on our equity team logistics group and help lead our BIPOC staff affinity group. I'll be talking about some of the programs and initiatives that are moving our racial equity work forward here at the Museum and Film Center. You've heard about upcoming and current exhibitions, and maybe you've noticed that many of them feature works by artists of color. Some have been collaboratively developed with artists and partners that uplift our BIPOC community. As an arts organization, it is important to us to welcome conversations about equity and racial justice issues. This year, my colleague Ted Smith, along with Ambush from Numbers FM, used art as a conversation starter to mark this past Juneteenth. In particular, the piece that was highlighted was a pair of figural candlesticks by Francis Nelm. You also heard about the See Me, I Am Here event, a partnership with the city of Portland that acknowledges the impact the pandemic has had on our BIPOC community. We were so grateful to participate in the Resist COVID Take Six public awareness campaign to share the message of resistance and hope from renowned artist, Portland native, and museum board member, Carrie Mae Weems. Beyond what is visible to the public, we actively reassess our internal policies, brainstorm new initiatives and learning opportunities, and strive to support our BIPOC staff. If you'd like to stay updated on our ongoing equity work, be sure to sign up to receive our email newsletters and follow us on social media. Thank you. I know I speak for the museum staff and our community when I say how glad I am that equity is so central to this organization. One gift we are especially proud to have received this year was a $100,000 grant from former Blazer Carmelo Anthony, who received the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Social Justice Award from the NBA. And he chose your Portland Art Museum in honor of the work we're doing to continue presenting works and exhibitions from black artists. If any of you know anyone who might be willing to match his generous gift, please let me know. And now, to close out this members update, Keeping Connected, Brian will conclude. Thank you all for being here and have a good night. Thank you, John, and to everyone who contributed to this program. It is gratifying to reflect on the hard work and energizing to know that our members are so invested in our mission. Thank you and good night.